Hi everyone, it's your favourite Intimate Blonde here with my nerdy weekly roundup. Hi everyone, I hope you're having or had a good week, I should say. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, um, busy week as always here, but uh, let's crack on. And as always, let's start with the uh, peripheral. So we're up to episode six of eight. So uh, next week is the penultimate one. Um, I did feel this episode was a bit of a filler. Um, we, it moves the story along a little bit, but I think it's more about... Um, uh, some of the motivations of the characters, uh, especially Connor, which I'll get into. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, still a good show. I'm still enjoying it. I'm really interested to see where this kind of ends up. Um, but yeah, this, this I guess this was probably the most disappointing episode so far. But, uh, you know, we'll see how it bridges the, the story for the next two episodes. So we start off uh, with a kind of flashback of Texas in 2028. And we see Burton's uh, squad of Marines. Um, and this is pretty much the scene we saw um, when Alita was shown the experiment um, of the of ramping up compassion in the brain and, and, and what happens to the soldiers. But we're actually obviously seeing it from their perspective. So again, we've got like Burton and Connor and the rest of the, the, the platoon. They know there's a, there's a dog kind of wrapped in barbed wire and it's um, just howling and it's in pain and it's scared. Um, and there's obviously a debate between the, the soldiers, like should, should we put it out of its misery? Should we shoot it? Should we help it? And Burton says that this is a known tactic of obviously the people they're fighting against, that they uh, will put a distressed animal. Um, so uh, it's basically an ambush or way to set it up. So obviously they'll go in to try and help it. Um, and Connor's and a few of them are like, oh, we, you know, we can't kill it. What, you know, when this debate goes on and then eventually like Connor just gets up and sort of goes after the dog. Um, the rest of the platoon then are like sort of scouring the area, making sure there's not snipers. Um, and he gets the dog safely um, and starts unclipping it from, from the barbed wire. He basically gets all the barbed wire off and he's like, mm, job done, nothing to worry about, completely safe. And then he sees there's like a, a device on the dog's collar and you sort of see it pan down. There's all these wires. And this poor dog has had a bomb sewn inside it. It's really not a pleasant scene. Um, it's quite disturbing, actually. Um, and obviously, the bomb goes off. Uh, I mean, you don't actually sort of see anything happen to the dog or, or to Connor. But, you know, <laughs> it's not rocket science. Um, yeah, and then he kind of, you know, uh, that, that that's how Connor lost his arm and, and his legs. And throughout the episode, there's several, he's like having, he still has flashbacks and night terrors. Um, hence why, you know, he, he kind of deals with this with drinking. Um, but again, it's that sort of backstory and sort of explaining why, why, you know, Connor is how he is, basically. Um, we then cut to the future where there's a, a police woman who goes up to, and she calls her mom. So we assume this is like inspector or chief of police or something and tells her about the murder of Daniel and that they found his body, that he'd uh, been killed by a, another peripheral um, and they're to investigate. Um, the actress playing the policewoman is uh, Angel uh, Mahindra, who you might better know as Rani from the Sarah Jane Adventures. So she's popped up in a few things recently, um, including like the Lazarus Project, which was very good on, on Sky. Um, but yeah, so she's playing a policewoman in this and is, is bringing this inspector up to speed. And this inspector um, basically sort of complains that she's like, you know, disturbed her on her walk. And she's like very, you know, arrogant, I think is the way to describe it. And we see more of her later. Um, we then uh, go back to um, uh, the Flynn's time, uh, 2032. And we cut to Tommy, who's all beaten up and bloody and grazed from the, from the car accident last week. Um, and he's speaking, he's, he's obviously logged the accident and uh, way back in like sort of episode two, one or two, he um, impounded one of the, the, the vehicles with the, from, from the future, has the, the sort of cloaking technology on it. 
and no pun intended the car's disappeared <laughs> it's like physically gone from the lockup and he's like well i put it there myself what's going on so there seems to be some sort of cover-up happening um and uh he um and they're all basically sort of saying, oh, I think, you know, you knocked your head a bit too hard, you know, with these invisible cars and all this kind of thing. And he starts having a nosebleed and goes into the, the bathroom. The chief of police follows him in um, and is basically sort of telling him that, you know, he needs to take some time off. He needs to step away from this. He needs to have some paid leave. He's obviously like quite beaten up. And uh, and the chief of police goes off into the toilet <laughs> um, and starts singing, as you do. Um, and then Tommy sort of, as he goes to sleep, looks around and, and sees just obviously the police chief's feet under the cubicle door. And he's got like his cowboy boots on and he recognises these cowboy boots from the crash. So when he crashed, obviously, we know somebody pulled the hitman Rob out of the car and kind of say that he's the same boots. So he's kind of putting together that the chief of police is um, basically working for Pickett and was in on. And, it, and basically the accident was an accident. It was it was an ambush. Um, we then go to the future and Flynn's with Wilf and they're kind of uh, walking down by the Thames there at the uh, Tower of London and Tower Bridge and as they're walking along and talking kind of Flynn's notices a few times but says to Wilf like why doesn't anybody kind of interact why does there nobody ever sort of like nobody ever sort of comes close to you there's no sort of you know there's always like quite a, a proximity between people and he basically then goes on to explain because it's not real so everything we've been seeing of London so far, it is London, but it kind of has a fake overlay on it. So there's always these lots of these sort of hand gestures they do that they can sort of type, turn things up, dial things down, and they've got the built-in AI, and that's how they get phone calls and stuff. So he tells her to sort of do this action. And then basically you kind of see the veneer go, and like obviously London's still there, but it's um, sort of like not rubble but all the buildings are kind of damaged and broken like from some kind of uh, war or explosion but the whole of London actually looks like this so he goes on to explain that this is some sort of you know uh, massive augmentation and they kind of call it a mood booster that if people you know can't sort of see the reality it's better than actually sort of living the reality um which Flynn's a bit like you know she sort of thought things are sort of better in the future but clearly that they're, they're really not um, and they talk about Alita and um, the the original peripheral that, that she came in and, um, you know, who's behind this, where they took the chips out of the peripherals heads when they, they found it at the property where Daniel was killed. And they go to this butcher's shop, uh, which is kind of a cover for um, a guy who builds these peripherals or does sort of augmentations to them. So they go in and ask for like, bear in mind, it's like toad in the hole. And for any Americans who don't know what toad in the hole is, it's um, basically sausages in, in like a Yorkshire pudding in like a batter cooked in the oven. Very nice. Um, and they'll recommend you have like something else. And he's like, no, 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 we don't want any toad in the hole. And um, he's not rising to it. So Flynn then basically starts saying about her peripheral and how well it's been built, and um, this guy's a bit of a has-been, you know, uh, the guy that's built his is like his main rival, and uh, if she could prove that he can build better peripherals than him, she can get her money back. So basically just playing to his ego, and he's like rises to it and says, yeah, come on, I'll, I'll take a look. They go sort of back into this sort of workshop, um, and they start discussing um, uh, things that can be done to, to the... Um, the peripheral um and he's and uh, he's like you know i can do it so your nails grow with talons and she goes oh can you do eye augment uh, you know uh augmentation and he's like oh that's easy that's you no know, yes that's basic stuff what do you want night vision do you want this do you want that and she says um is it possible to like to replace an eye with a real human eye obviously going back to um episode one uh to which obviously a, a fight breaks out between between flynn and um the butcher in it, I think it's his girlfriend or his wife, and this fight breaks out. Um, and she obviously manages to sort of uh, um, overwhelm them and sort of, you know, basically uh, take control of the situation. Um, and they start asking questions about Alita. And, and the, he basically says <coughs> that he can't answer the questions because they'll kill him. And they're like, well, if you don't answer our questions, we're going to hurt you. 
And um, it basically comes to light that uh, this is all to do with the neo primes who kind of want to bring down London as it is. And obviously, we know from the previous episodes that Wilf killed a load of neo primes at his school. Um, and they are like, what makes you think it's neo primes? And it was like, it was always like old, old world sort of, te- you know, uh, skills and surgery with a scalpel. So uh, Flynn goes on to sort of say to Wilf, like, why didn't you say it was neo primes and she's involved in neo primes? And he's like, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't, you know, because obviously he's really taken aback by this information given what, what happened at his school. Um, we then go back um, and we see Connor um, he's um, having problems with his um, kind of wheelchair automatic bike kind of thing and it's not working so he has to sort of try and repair it and it sort of plays out that um, uh, one of the tech guys comes and helps him puts it all together and then he sort of starts speaking to the tech guy about the 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 peripherals and he's uh, and initially he sort of like I can't really comment on that I don't really know it's up to Flynn and Burton uh, yeah Flynn and Burton to, to decide what it is you know you should know and he explains well I've already been in it I've worn one of the headsets you know and there's like a, a body there um and he's like would it be possible like how long could you stay in it is it possible that he could basically stay in the future and he goes on to talk about that when first obviously um, had the injuries, he was pretty much out of it for eight months. And obviously he had a feeding tube and capita and things like that. And basically, could they put him in like a permanent state here in 2032 so he could live his life in um, in the future with a whole whole body? Um, and this is like kind of like, you know, what he's gearing himself up, up, up to doing and uh and uh, yeah, he's, he's like, I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's possible, and you know, we'd have to talk to Burton about it. Um, and then we we, pick, we get we do see that in the future they're basically building the bodies for Connor and for Burton um, as per Flynn's request previously, um, and they're literally sort of being applied with the AI and they're starting to come to life. There's lots of backwards and forwards in this episode. <laughs> um, then we go. Then we basically find out that, yes, the hitman Rob is at Pickett's and they've fitted him with like a kind of restraining bolt collar thing that basically tases him if he tries to attack them or do anything. Um, so they're, they're keeping him there. There's information that Pickett wants and basically Rob's just not even speaking. He's not he's not giving them anything that they want. Um then we see in the past that the inspector and the policewoman um, arrive at Lev's house um, and everybody just kind of bricks it. So this this inspector, Lobeer, I think she's called, um, it, it's no one to be messed with at the end of the day. And then there's some comments around like kind of the justice system in the future. So as they kind of get into it, there's a bit of like sort of standoff straight away. Lev's like, get the family solicitors. And she started that's right. This is how it's going to play out. If you you go get the solicitors, I'm going to arrest Wilf. Um, we've got you know evidence to or triangulated coordinates to show that he was at this place when Daniel was murdered. Um, we can basically prove he was an accessory and he can be uh put to death basically. So, in terms of the justice system, it sounds a bit like Judge Dredd. <laughs> so, yeah, she, you know, and this would all happen like within a day or something. So and sort of goes on to explain, but, you know, we all know Will's just a little fish and I want a big fish. And so how about, you know, you kind of level with me with what, what's actually going on and we can kind of get, get on with things rather than sort of dragging all this out and uh, Will be <laughs> executed, basically. Um, we then see Tommy going to uh, Burton, explaining about the ambush. Um, obviously, Burton's pissed that this guy's back out there. Um, but he's he's like kind of, sort of Tommy's trying to say to like Burton, but you're missing the point because he's Tommy. Uh, Burton's like, well, if it was an ambush, somebody'd have to know that you had him where you were going. And he's like, Preci- precisely, and sort of explains to him that he, the chief of police is basically in Pickett's pocket, Pickett's pocket, <laughs> um, and he's helping him. And that he's ninety nine percent sure that Pickett's now got the got the hitman. Um, and then Burton sort of goes on to say to Tommy, like, you know, that you need to back off away from this. There's other factors at play. And Tommy's like, what the hell are you on about? And he's just like, look, you've got really banged up this time. It could be worse next time. So just, you know, you need to step away from this. So before you, before you get killed. 
Um, then we go to Pickett's house. Um, Pickett's with the chief of police. Um, chief of, the chief of police has left him with the computer, tells him his, his password, which is <laughs> fuck off and eat shit in capitals, which he thinks is absolutely hilarious. Um, and Pickett logs in and starts starts watching something. So this is the extent of the corruption that he's allowed to start, you know, start looking at witness statements and recordings and things like that. So back at the house, um, Pickett's wife is explaining that there's a car that she wants. And basically, if she can get Rob to start talking or talking about anything, she can get this car. And if there's something he wants, she's sure she can get it for him. Um, and there's a massive great like, fish tank in the room. It's absolutely huge. And Rob starts asking questions about this fish tank, about how much water is it? Is it salt water? And she just goes on to explain that they did have tropical fish, but they kept dying. So this is just now like, you know, normal water. And while, she, while she's sort of talking and painting her toenails, Rob leans forward and picks up a, like a, an ornament off the table, this big sort of lion statue thing, like metal, really heavy, and kind of puts that behind his, his back and they're chatting away. And uh, so, and she's a bit like, oh, see, like, you know, um, you know, you're sort of playing ball kind of thing because he's talking. Um, and he sort of gets up and walks over to the fish tank and she's like, well, what are you doing? And then he basically throws this ornament at the fish tank and it kind of starts cracking and uh, she's like freaking out like what what are you doing and uh, the, the fish tank just goes and this water goes everywhere and they both get drenched in this water um so that I think and then, <laughs> then she's just so he sort of they're both both like laying there and she picks up the, the shocker obviously covered in water so she hits the shocker on the, the collar taser so they both get electrocuted um, but then he's like, he comes to and opens his eyes first. I think the whole thing is obviously trying to short out this, this collar. Um, we go back to the future um, and the conversation sort of happened with Lev and he's explained around what the stub is and what these peripherals are. And she basically wants to see the, the three AI peripherals and their operators. So they send a message to the past to say they need to, to come in. Um, Uh, and they want that sooner rather than later. So the so yeah, uh, Burton's with Connor, um, and he's talking to him about this idea and what he wants to do. And from the future, they've sent some some artificial limbs, that are obviously better than anything they can get in their time. He's taking them over, and um, like talking about you know his idea. And uh, but it's just like, look, I'm going to have to think about this. I'm not I'm not saying I'm not going to help you, but you know, dude, this is like a. You know, it's a really big thing being to ask and you kind of um they don't come out and say it but at the time um after the accident they kind of implied that basically connor i had asked burton to, to to finish him off to kill him and obviously burton couldn't they were like childhood friends um so you know um it's it's a big it's a big deal and, and a big consideration so then the phone call comes through um and then we cut to the future and the three of them arrive in their peripherals and the inspector goes up and sort of introduces herself and I think they're all a bit like, oh, the police. And then it ends. So, like I say, a little bit of a filler episode, um, but definitely you can feel like we're ramping up to something for the last two episodes. This whole sort of Connor storyline, whether he can stay in the future. We've now kind of got Rob the Hitman running around. Pickett's still up to something, you know, why, why is he looking at the uh, police records? Um, obviously, uh, Flynn and the others are still in danger. And now the police are in the mix as well. We found out Elite is part of Neo Prime. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on in the episode. Um, so I don't feel it's like a total filler, like nothing really happens. But, um, you know, the, it, it definitely feels like a bridging episode leading up to something. So as long as we get something in the next two episodes... I'll be happy with this one. So that's the peripheral. So two episodes to go, penultimate next week. As ever, you can find that on Prime and that drops weekly on a Friday. So the other show this week that I've been wanging on about the last few weeks, 1899. So for those who haven't uh, heard me talk about this, um, the premise, this is made by uh, or written by two guys that wrote the German series Dark, which is also on Netflix, a three series sort of time travel, all set in this sort of one town. 
which is a really, really great show. You really have to follow what's going on. It's very simple, but a great, great show. So based on knowing that going into this again, you know, you've got to pay attention to everything that's going on. So our premise is we've kind of got a, a ship, um, an immigrant ship on its way from Europe to uh, New York. Um, the company is uh, part German, part, part British. It's the crew's made up of sort of German and, and British people. Um, and like I say, they're all heading over to New York with a, a mixed bag <laughs> of, of um, passengers. Um, some are French, some are English, some are German, some are Japanese. All with their own sort of stories. And um, already in two episodes, you can see that they've all got, kind of got their own backstories and they've all kind of got secrets and uh, nothing's quite quite as it appears. So as they're traveling across the Atlantic to New York, they receive a um, distress signal. When they look at the distress signal, they believe it's from their, their sort of sister ship, the Prometheus. So we find out that, yeah, this is actually a sister ship of theirs, the sort of same company. Um, and they, they, they go to investigate. Um, the Prometheus, we, all we know is it disappeared sometime before. Nobody, obviously... It disappeared, so nobody know where it went, uh, what's happened to it. Everybody assumes that it's sunk, but obviously they get any signal. So they go, they board, they, they, they find the ship and go on board and investigate. There's a group of them all go over there. Um, there's sort of captain, uh, a guy who's a, a priest, but we basically find out he's posing as a priest, who's with another guy, and they're, they're basically um, gay and uh, obviously back in 1899 that was uh, I, I think it was illegal but um obviously that's very frowned upon so they're pretending to be brothers and it's um it's, whether he's a real priest it's not probably not if he's gay but who knows but anyway so he's like so why do you want me to go and they're like um you're a priest and he's like oh oh yeah right <laughs> so he goes over with members of the crew uh, a woman it's a woman uh, on there uh, uh, Myra Franklin She's a doctor. Now we find out that she's she's there because she's looking for her brother. Her brother disappeared. We're not sure whether he was on the Prometheus or not, but she's received this letter um, sort of saying like to be on this ship and uh, he's got something to do with the Prometheus. So, so she's there trying to get to New York to find her, her brother who went missing four months ago. Um. Uh, so they they all aboard they go aboard the, the Prometheus um, and the ship's kind of uh, been sort of totaled and um, it's in a rough state. So it looks like it's been missing a long time and they uh, obviously search the whole ship um, and they find nobody um, and then they sort of hit here and this noise and they open a cupboard and a little boy's in there and he's just like ash and white and like just looks traumatized and in shock and he hands to this this woman moira um this um, sort of metal pyramid like sort of yeah metal pyramid um we don't know what it is or what it does um but he just basically hands this to her and obviously they 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 all go back onto to their ship um they look uh, they examine the little boy for all types of purposes he's, he's okay um, but he's just not talking. Um, and sort of uh, two episodes in, he's still not not really talking, and he's just a creepy kid, really creepy kid. <laughs> um, but he's not he's not saying, you know, what happened. All he keeps doing is is taking this this pyramid uh, thing and, and and giving it to her. Um, after they've boarded the ship and come back um the the crew so kind of like the next day the crew come and get go get to the captain uh and they said you know you need to see it so he goes up to the bridge and all the compasses are, are just just spinning on the bridge and anyway even holding a compass that that's just spinning so like the magnetic things just going mental so the crews all sort of get a bit spooked and a bit like you know something isn't right and there's something not right with that ship um they obviously have sent a message a telegram um, back to the company to say we found the Prometheus. What what do you want us to do? And uh, obviously these these ships are huge, cost of fortune, um, worth a lot of money, 
and they just come back and tell them to sink the ship. That's all it says, sink ship. So they're all a bit like, what, 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 what the hell? You know, why, why? You know, something's like really off about all of this. Um, the captain. Then we find out uh, lost his family. His wife uh, basically uh, murdered uh, uh, his three daughters and herself by setting fire to their house. Um, so he's quite, uh, he's quite a traumatized and um, grief stricken man. And again, when they come back, he then starts um, hearing uh, a, a child singing. And it's his, basically his daughter. And he sees his daughter, Nina, and he goes running after her. And then he ends up back at the family house. He's like, we're, uh, you know, so he right, he's like outside the house and he goes in. And the wife's there and the children are there and the child's singing. And the wife's, oh, like, the, the children have been waiting up for you. We're glad you're home and he's like sort of like what the hell is going on he's like you're not real you're not real and they're like and the, the daughter's like of course i'm real what's you know what, what's going on and then she just like kind of bursts into flames in, in front of him um and then he kind of he then gets like thrown backwards like an explosion and when he wakes up or he looks around he's still he's in the charred remains of the house and obviously he's like freaking out so he he like runs and tries to get out and then he's like going through his passageway and then comes out back in his room on the ship. He sort of opens this trap door and there's this, this triangle shape that we keep seeing is on this trap door. And so he's, he's like sort of under the bed back in his room. So he's like freaking out because he keeps hearing and seeing his family. Um, we, this, this, uh, we get introduced to this ca uh, character called Daniel who's in the cabin next to Moira and he's like really, really creepy and keeps following her around. Um, and he has this strange kind of beetle, this sort of green and gold beetle that he kind of sets down and it goes scuttling around. Um, <laughs> we don't really know why. Um, and he's in the cabin next to her, but everywhere she goes, he's just kind of there and, and loitering. It's very, very strange. Um, there's... Uh, some of the other relationships, if there's a, a French couple, a French guy, and they've recently got married and they're on their honeymoon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's not going very well. And he's like, you, you don't love me. You never love me. This is all just kind of convenience. And he's kind of caught the, uh, there's a, a, a Japanese geisha girl that he's kind of a bit infatuated with. Then we find out the Japanese geisha girl is... Um, doesn't speak Japanese so she's learning Japanese so she's obviously Japanese descent but obviously they're trying to make out that uh, she's she's you know not westernized in any way and they're trying to pass her off as Japanese hence why she's learning Japanese so again this is like some of all the the, the secrets coming out um as a sort of brother and sister from third class um and the sisters are washing her brother's hair and they're, they're sort of chatting and um, one of the guys from first class, so the, the priest and the boyfriend who's posing to be his brother, you know, it's, it sort of is attracted to this guy from first from third class who has a scar on his face. Um, and he sort of goes down and gives him a cigarette case and the, the, the girl goes off. And then um, his other sisters just like, you know, don't don't take things from rich people. They always want something back. And his little sister's like gone off and she's the. Uh, because they had a bit of a set, set to, and uh, she she catches the sight of this little beetle thing, and she starts following it, and she sort of drops her a rag doll on the floor, and she just and she sort of continues to follow it, and sort of just you know she goes off, and we we don't see what happens to her. Um, the captain asks one of the um, engineers, the the guys who, because obviously these were run on coal, so they're always there shoving to find out how much coal they've actually got left. Um, and he comes back and sort of says, we've got you know, this, that, and the other thing. So the captain, after sort of having these visions, um, decides that they need to turn around. They're going to tow the Prometheus back to Europe. Um, and that's kind of his decision. <coughs> Excuse me. The passengers are not happy about this. He's saying, look, we haven't got enough coal to tow the Prometheus and get to New York, but we've got enough to get back. Obviously, they're really unhappy about this. They've paid to get to New York. Myra's like kind of freaking out about this as well because she's got to get there because she's had this letter supposedly from her brother who went missing. So uh, the, cam uh, the captain goes up on deck and Moira follows him. 
and says, look, we've got we've got to get to New York. And he's like, no, uh, this is my decision. Um, and he then says he got this letter. And on the back of the envelope, it says, um, what is lost will be found. This is the same envelope and, and letter that Moira received, supposedly from her brother. Um, he said, I, I received this letter with a picture of my family in it. I'm now seeing my family. I'm hearing my family that, that you know, this, this shit, there's something really wrong with this ship. Um, Prometheus and you know th this is my decision and she sort of sees the letter and is like obviously taken aback because it's identical to the one that she's got and on her one it also says um, what is lost will be found written on the back of the envelope um, the the crew are not revolting at this stage but they're the sort of the first officer and that are all discussing that maybe you know maybe we should just sink the ship that's our orders Captain's gone against that. Um, and they're, they're sort of speculating and they're like, yeah, yeah, maybe we should. And one of the crew, uh, one of the crew starts to, to walk back to go back inside. And you see him sort of look and he sees something. We don't really see what it is. Then um, it's, you know, again, the, the crew member goes, goes to the captain and says, you need to come and see this. And the captain's like, what is it? And he's like, you, you just need to see. The captain goes up onto the bridge, uh, uh, onto the deck. And then we sort of pan down and it's the little girl. So the, th the third class passenger's sister is following this bug thing. She's she's dead on, on the deck. Then something really weird happens. <laughs> so the, there's a shot on the captain's face. And as the camera sort of pans back, you can see like it's a, a TV monitor. Um, and it keeps panning back, panning back. And then you basically got a wall with sort of, um, sort of six or seven TV monitors each is like sort of the main characters. So you've got cap the captain, you've got um, Myra, you've got Daniel, and this Daniel guy, this creepy guy, he's following Moira around. He, You see him at some point, he takes, towards the end, he takes out a picture of Moira, so somehow he knows her. So, but the, the freaking thing is like, there's TV monitors in 1899. So it's like someone's watching all of this play out from somewhere. And that's the, how the second episode ends. So I've only watched the two so far, um, but so far living up to my expectations, it's intriguing as hell. We have absolutely no idea what's going on. We see this triangle symbol everywhere. The little boy that they find sort of has a tattoo a bit behind his ear. At one point, the Morse code machine starts going and it's just all these triangles coming out. <laughs> I do not have a clue what is going on and it's brilliant and I love it. So yeah, massively two, two episodes in, I'm already hooked. Like I need to know what the hell is going on. Uh, good characterization, good acting so far, really good acting. The guy that plays the captain is amazing. He's on this, uh, you know, he's sort of on the verge of cracking up already on the second episode in. Obviously he's got all this grief and seeing his dead family everywhere. Um, yeah, they've just they've done a really good job of sort of setting up that, everybody on this ship sort of has secrets or they're looking for something nothing's nothing's what it appears to be is kind of the setup which I love so yeah I'm really pleased so far again I think this is eight eight episodes two in it's dropped on Netflix that they're, they're all there so I'm going to continue watching um whether I'll have a chance to watch all of it by next week if not I will give you the review on however many episodes I've got through but uh, yeah, and as, as ever, as you know, if you're a fan of this channel, I love my mystery box stuff. I'm such a sucker for it. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely set up um, two really interesting episodes. It's not going to be for everyone. It's uh, I, I, I'm enjoying the pacing because there's a lot to there's a lot of setup to get through. I I think some people might find it a bit ploddy, but I think having that I've watched Dark, it's that kind. It's a very similar sort of pacing, so um, I'm really comfortable with it. But I could see a few. I could see people being like, "Oh, it's a little bit, you know, to to get through." But um, yeah, I'm loving it. The the look of it, the feel of it. So the acting is really good. Um, so yeah, I'm excited as to where where on earth this is going to go. The, the setup, the pretense, just two episodes in is, is brilliant. You know, we've got so many questions and no answers right now. Um, and, and the ending of episode two with the TV monitors just blew my mind. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh my God. So yeah, um, 1899 Netflix, go check it out. 
so that's it. I mean, that's really all I've had time to watch this week. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, just real life is just a bit crazy at the moment, but it's good to have a good two solid shows that, that I'm able to watch. Um, yeah, I guess over the coming weeks, we'll start getting more Christmas stuff coming out. Um, and I'll probably try and do a few reviews of some of my favorite sort of Christmas films and things like that probably on Atomic Rewind, but I might chat through some of them on here as well as the sort of new shows wind down and we get all the Christmas um, stuff coming through. Uh, as I previously said, my rule is no Christmas films to the 1st of December, so a couple of weeks to go. But once then, I'll start watching some of the new ones, some of the, uh, you know, some classics and some incredibly cheesy. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure the uh, Lindsay Lohan Netflix uh, Christmas film is going to be cheese as. But um, hey, it's Christmas. You've got to do it right. So anyway, have a great week. Enjoy the shows. Do like, share and subscribe if you've liked what you've seen. If you haven't, sorry about that. But you can always leave me a comment or find me on Twitter, AndyLDM50. Uh, if you've got some suggestions of uh, things, uh, shows you want me to uh, review or what you'd like to see, if you don't like what you're seeing right now and if you do like it, that's great. So subscribe and share because that really, really helps. And just drop me some comments around what you think about the shows I'm reviewing. Maybe you hate them. Let's talk about it. What don't you like? And if you love them as much as I do, love to dissect them with you. So have a great week and I will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.